Now listen closely, because I'm only going to say this once. As I was going to St. Ives, I met a man with seven wives. Every wife had seven sacks. Every sack had seven cats. Every cat had seven kits. Kits, cats, sacks, and wives, how many were going to St. Ives? The answer will be at the end of the episode. Put on your disguise, pour yourself a cup of tea, and take a step between silver and glass to a world of homebrew magic where secrets are power and daytime reality need not apply. For those of you under the radar and in the know, I'm Lane Lockridge, and you're listening to The Noctuary. What I'm going to tell you this episode isn't necessarily a secret, but rather like everything I tell you, yet another method of keeping your secrets under wraps. You provide them, and I teach you how to hide them. Today, we're covering the fundamental theory behind every magician's trick, misdirection. How it can be used in your games, your covert operation, and for this particular time of year, for disguises. Let's begin. Misdirection. Defined in the Merriam-Webster as a wrong direction the act or an instance of misdirecting or diverting, or the state of being misdirected. Misdirection is, in its simplest definition, the art of pointing someone's attention the wrong way. A magician does this with their gaze, looking one way and enticing us to look the same way, while their hands do something else out of sight. Without it, the illusionist has no craft. No amount of palming, producing, levitating, or vanishing will save the trick from being found out if we're looking at where the action is happening. But if they can guide the eye away, towards empty space and smoke and mirrors, then voila, magic takes place. Politicians do this too. When they're asked an uncomfortable question that they can't neatly dismiss, they distract. Maybe pulling up some other inflammatory issue or sidestepping with something emotional or not quite related, all the while making the listener fail to realize that their question isn't being answered. Lawyers have a little more finesse with it, using complex jargon to muddle their answer to further distract readers or listeners from the truth. Nobody likes to be fooled unless it's entertaining, which is probably why we love to hate these two types of people. So what can be used to misdirect attention? Magicians use the gaze, and politicians use their word, but if you're like me and have no talent for sleight of hand or word vomit, then there are other options. Let's make a list of what draws attention. Loud noises will do it. Movement, too. Lighter colors tend to stand out more than darker colors, unless it's a dark color on a light background. Let's try an example. If you like spooky games, like Slender, this one will be helpful. Once, when I was with friends, I put up a few pages in the woods and asked them to find the papers. I would play the Slenderman. The rules were simple. They had to find the pages before I tagged them. If they looked right at me, I couldn't move, unless I was within a few feet. I still caught all of them. How did I do it? Late in the autumn as it was, crunching along in the woods? I moved only when the wind blew. There was noise to cover my tracks. I also threw things whenever I wanted someone to look somewhere else long enough for me to shift my position. It's a classic Looney Tunes strategy right there, but it works. If you're ever bored and need some practice with a combination of hide and seek, tag, and the most intense red light, green light you'll ever play, I highly recommend this game, especially since it's October and Halloween is in the air. Speaking of Halloween, it's time to talk disguises. Once again, it's the time of year where it's socially acceptable to go out in public as someone you're not. And it need not be elaborate, just a few small details that can conceal one's entire identity. Stay tuned. Shh. Not so fast, listeners. I've got a red herring for you. Let's play a little game. I'll call it What's in a Name? Lizzie Hale, Faith Evans, Mary Ramsey, Dave Navarro, Tori Amos, Paul McCartney, Amy Echo, Donnie Iris, Sting, Mitch Allen, Amy Lee, John Iden, Kurt Cobain, Roy Estrada. If you can figure it out, be sure to take the door on the left. So say you need to vanish. It's a rather common complaint in our community, considering the sort of 
well, you know, I won't get into detail, but mischief is the name of the game. And sometimes, for safety or the sake of one's reputation, it's necessary to not be yourself for a little while. And in this digital age, it's far easier, and also far more difficult than ever, to do just that. Take a glance into the cosplay community, and you'll find all sorts of useful tutorials for swapping your gender with a few strokes of contouring, or making yourself older or younger with just a few small details. Nowadays, it's not hard to learn how to look like someone else. But what about really pulling it off? Really fooling the ones you need to fool? Well, I'm sorry to burst your bubble, but stage makeup and a costume aren't going to pull the wool over most people's eyes. What really sells a disguise is the act. No one is going to take you for a lady if you walk like a man, no one will think you're a teenager if you don't talk like it, and if you can't get the accent down, you certainly won't pass as a foreigner. Want some good examples to follow, then? The series Alias is a good start. Look to the scene in Season 1's first episode where an operative puts on a disguise using outrageous red hair and a snappy attitude. It's the attitude that matches the hair that makes it work. Same for the film Argo. This one's even better, being based on a true story. In Argo, the CIA rescues a number of hostages from Iran by training them to embody a film crew from Canada. Their lives depended on their ability to play their roles as location scouts. The operation was a roaring success, everyone made it back home alive, and nowadays we have a perfect lesson in disguise to look back on. Want to see some bad disguises? Well, outside the comical mustaches and trench coats, any example involving shoplifting, doing nothing but change your hair, or trying to play a role you just aren't suited for make for some embarrassing situations, namely getting caught. Don't try to play a doctor if you don't have the expertise. Try not to get mistaken for someone. And for heaven's sake, show some class and don't shoplift your disguise. Not only is it illegal, it also robs you of the ability to tailor secret pockets into your new identity's outfit. So remember, for an effective disguise, your goal is not to look better and it's not to stand out. It's to be forgettable, to blend in and be unnoticeable. Learning to walk like you belong, how to blend in with the look and the body language of a crowd, and above all, having an effective cover story and an act are all elements of a successful disguise. It takes a little more theater than you think. And now, to take a page from the finest fictional society, the VFD, let's talk about a disguise kit. You know I would never leave you without some kind of craft you could take home with you. So for those of you who have a little spare time on your hands, it's worthwhile to put together a proper disguise kit to keep handy at your dwelling or in your car in order to quickly shed your identity when the occasion arises. I'm not talking about a pair of glasses with fake noses and a mustache. I don't mean Bond-style cases with contact lenses and peel-off fake faces and hands. Nothing so advanced. You don't need it. This sort of thing is something that anyone can put together, courtesy of the VFD, with a few of my own additions and changes. If you're unfamiliar with the VFD, then I first must congratulate you on finding this podcast and welcome you to the community. The VFD is best explained by one Lemony Snicket and his publications. I'll leave you to explore them on your own time. A proper disguise kit involves a number of outfits that can fundamentally change not only one's appearance, but also one's demeanor, one's gait, and other details that really define a person and their silhouette. Some kits are more advanced than others, using peg legs, fake hands, and so on, but mine's a little more refined, I like to think. First and foremost, examine yourself. Examine what you have to work with. What can you add or remove to immediately change? If you wear glasses, take them off. If you wear your hair up all the time, let it down. Remove identifying elements from yourself. Then start adding back other details. Now, a basic kit will include the following. First, cosmetics. I usually include foundation several shades off from my natural skin tone, and when applying foundation for disguise purposes, make sure to cover all visible skin. This includes your face, neck, ears, and hands. Body foundation exists in order to fake a tan or a fair tone, and these are worth looking into. Also in your makeup, you want to include bronzer, highlighter, and eyeshadow for the purpose of contouring to change your bone structure, and the matching makeup brushes. Make sure you get various colors of blush, lipstick, and eyeshadow, false lashes if you're feeling up to it, and if you're really sassy, face glue and short hair for faking a beard and a mustache. Second, glasses of various types. Make sure to include sunglasses. Third, a wig. If you can't get wigs, try a set of hats or clip-in hair extensions, anything to change your hair on the go. 
Fourth, coats, long and short, of the wrong sizes, padded and tailored to alter your figure. Something to make you look thicker or thinner, as you wish. Fifth, pants, of various sizes, to make you look taller or shorter, by virtue of illusion. Six, compression wear, to alter your figure. The ability to slim down or thicken up at will is fundamental. I simply cannot stress this enough. Your silhouette in disguise is essential. Seventh, heeled shoes or elevator shoes for altering your height. Eighth, garters and suspenders. Now, these are not to be used for their correct usage, that is, holding clothing in place, but instead to restrict movement in very specific ways to alter how you move. Ninth, False nails, to imitate healthy nails if yours aren't healthy, or to imitate unhealthy nails if yours are perfect. These can also be used to make false teeth, disguise-style veneers. Just don't eat or drink in them. Tenth, gloves. Eleventh, a cane and medical braces. Twelfth, hairspray and hair gel. Thirteenth, and this one's important, several different perfumes and colognes. People remember smell better than any other sense, so if you want to pull off an old person, you need to smell like it. Same for a homeless person, a fastidious, wealthy person, a doctor, and so on. Think of what they smell like and see what you can do to reproduce it. Fourteenth, pocket litter. Now what is pocket litter? It's just the sort of thing that you'll have hanging around in your pockets, or would have, if you were really the person you're playing. A football fan will have ticket stubs on game nights. Someone who's frugal will have receipts and coupons. Someone who owns a bike will have their key to the bike chain. Small details. They're important. And finally, this one's my own personal edition, a temporary tattoo kit. You can find online a rather clever method with body paint, hairspray, and baby powder to create a temporary tattoo that remains at least 24 hours without washing off. Make sure to keep this kit dispersed in your usual wardrobe and any obvious elements, like wigs in the tattoo kit, hidden where you know they won't be found. If you need a bit of misdirection you can use to throw others off when they discover your kit, you can claim to be a cosplay enthusiast. In all technicality, you won't be entirely untruthful. And now it's time for me to send you off into the world to raise havoc, but first, the moment you've been waiting for, it's time for the solution to St. Ives. I'll read the riddle again. As I was going to St. Ives, I met a man with seven wives. Every wife had seven sacks, every sack had seven cats, every cat had seven kits. Kits, cats, sacks, and wives, how many were going to St. Ives? How many? The answer I'll give you in a moment. Now that you've heard it again, it should be clear you don't have to do any calculation. How many were going to St. Ives? Just one. I. I'll see you next episode as we continue the Halloween season, my favorite time of the year, with a little mischief of most dangerous games and seeking and hiding and concealing and finding. It's time to talk ciphers. Next time, for now, adieu. When the mask comes off and the teacup is empty, make sure to spare a glance back at the looking glass. In a show concerning secrets, there are secrets to be found. Now ask yourself, was there anything you might have missed? I'll leave you to your pondering and to add to noctuaries of your own. Happy scheming!